Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Park. Um, aloha, everybody. Aloha. Good to be uh, with you. Good to be uh, with friends that I have seen last week. Um, and now again, uh, this morning, uh, my family and I have been spending the week uh, on Maui. And um, it's been, uh, it's been a, an amazing experience. And I've told them in church on Sunday morning, well, you know, if we come back, you are the ones to be blamed for that. So just remember that because you really made our stay uh, something quite extraordinary. Um, and, and, and we were talking about uh, the spirit that we found here uh, in the conference and in the church and amongst the people. Um, that, and that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. It reminds us so much of home that you're not driving me into nostalgia. You're making me feel much more at home. So that is an achievement. Um, not every place where I have been in my life <laughs> has been able to. So thank you so much also to be here in this wonderful facility this morning. Um, I thank you for that. What we're going to do, uh, we have decided is, uh, we're going to have uh, two sessions this morning, and so the first session, um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about um, the recent book that I have co-authored with uh, Professor Curtis de Young of Bethel University in, uh, in Minneapolis called Radical Reconciliation, Beyond Political Pietism and Christian Quietism. Um, we'll talk a bit about that. And, and I apologize once again that the book is not available here. Um, if I come back and should we talk about that again, we will not be so remiss. We will plan way ahead and make sure that, that, that every publisher has the opportunity to send a book uh, with no excuse, um, as if Hawaii is somewhere in an unreachable space. Uh, if we can get here by playing the book, we can get here too. So, so I apologize uh, because it would have helped if you could have at least uh, not read the book, but at least know about it. But we'll talk a bit about that. And then the second uh, portion of our day, um, we will talk about one of my absolute favorite things, and that is biblical interpretation. Um, in our reform tradition, that is what uh, has grown to be unique. Um, that is what has made me understand what that tradition is all about um, and made me see also uh, the amazing power of the Word of God. Um, Desmond Tutu and I used to say to everyone who wanted to hear that we believe that the Bible is in fact the most revolutionary book on earth. It is also the most encouraging book on earth. And in every publication that I have ever uh, let see the light, you will find that I return constantly um, to this book. Um, so this morning, uh, uh, it's also about our understanding of radical reconciliation because of our understanding of how the Bible talks about it. And then in the second session, I propose that we look at um, one or two biblical texts just to sort of illustrate very practically uh, how I understand such an interpretation of the Bible. Um, so let's talk a bit about the book. Now, Radical Reconciliation is the title. The subtitle is Beyond Political Pietism and Christian Quietism. Now we know that we mostly talk about pietism in the church. <clears throat> That's when people are overly concerned with the things of heaven and not too worried about the things of the earth. And I always say, uh, when I talk about that, I wish that Christians would just understand that heaven is really nothing of our business. There's nothing you can do about that. Oh, you, 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 you must try to get there, obviously. And some of us actually do. 
Most of us who think we will get there probably won't. <laughs> but, but in order to get there, you got to do right, right here first. Uh, and so I say to people, heaven is God's business. And I leave heaven in the best hands I can think of. What God has in mind for us is to ask the question, how on this earth do I bring a piece of heaven to the people right here? How do I let them see what we talk about when we talk about heaven? And then you have to deal, of course, with all of the pain and all of the suffering and the hunger and the violence and the degradation um, and the despoliation of, of, uh, of God's image uh, in us as human beings and the destruction of God's creation. But this is where our job is. But political pietism is something different. So radical reconciliation. We believe that reconciliation is not an option for Christians. It's not as if we can wake up one morning and decide to bargain with God whether we will be agents of reconciliation. That is something that is a given. If we follow Jesus Christ, if we love Jesus Christ, one of the things that we must be doing in this world is to stand by God in God's efforts to reconcile the world with God's self. That's our job. That takes many, many forms. And we have no choices. We cannot say to God, oh yes, I will reconcile with this person because she suits me better. But that one, I don't really want to. Then God will probably say to you, you leave that one that you like so much and you go right there. Um, we need to understand what it really does mean. That we cannot come to God with even the best sacrifice that we have to offer. Because God will stop us at the altar. And God will say to us, before you offer me a sacrifice, put it down here, think about the brother and the sister. Who has got something against you? Then you go and you make that right. And when you've done that, then you come and you bring your sacrifice. So you, in order to have a relationship with God, we have to have a reconciled relationship with our brothers and our sisters right here. So that's our point of departure. We talk about radical reconciliation, though because radical means to go back to the roots, that's the meaning of the old Latin word radix, so you don't, you don't just look at the tree and you admire the beautiful leaves or the flowers like you have here, just around every single corner. I haven't seen uh, this in, in, in all my life, really. Uh, and, and so, so you can get so mesmerized that you forget that there are roots down there. Um, and if you don't tend to the tree in the right way, and you don't know about the roots down there, you will always be mesmerized by the beauty of the flowers, but that doesn't get you much in the end. So radical, radical reconciliation is because any reconciliation that seeks to be biblical will be radical. That's our conclusion. And so in the book, you will find us returning time and time again um, to the biblical roots of reconciliation, to the biblical demands of reconciliation. How is it understood through Jesus in the time of empire, which is the time in which Jesus lived? What does it mean to talk about reconciliation when the Romans control you with an iron fist, when the temple elites exploit the people of God, exploit their love for God, exploit their fear of God, exploit their vulnerability, exploit the power of the temple, exploit the presence of God in the temple. What does it mean to talk reconciliation through the mouth of Jesus? That's, those are the questions we ask. We, in, in one or two of the chapters, we actually take some biblical passages to try and illustrate what we understand the Bible to say to us. So in that book, 
you will find a whole chapter on uh, Zacchaeus um, in Luke chapter 19. You say, if we want to understand what reconciliation is, Jesus has left us Zacchaeus as the example. Um, and, and that is so radical what that man is doing. And so I'm talking to church people who go to church regularly, who love Jesus, who read their Bible, so I don't need to explain too much, right? <laughs> Um, so, so Zacchaeus uh, does things, and we try to draw lessons in the book. What does Zacchaeus teach us about reconciliation, about remorse, about repentance, about asking for forgiveness, about receiving forgiveness, about how that means salvation, about restitution? So some of us... Um, we have found both in the United States, because he writes from the perspective of the U.S., I write from the perspective of, of, of South Africa, and I see both our churches here and both our politicians here have one failing in common, the great temptation that we cannot seem to resist, and that is to try and get away with a cheap reconciliation. We talk about it all the time, it seems, but we try to get away with something cheap, something that will not cost us anything. We, and we have, we have tried to understand that when you look at it from the biblical point of view, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. And Zacchaeus is such a, uh, is such a marvelous example, and if you wish, we could talk um, about that uh, later on in the discussion. And there's another example that I use uh, in my section of the book, uh, and that comes from uh, the book, uh, the second book of Samuel, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. It's an amazing story of a woman called Rizpah, who was uh, the widow of King Saul. Um, and King Saul is dead, and David is on the throne, and there is a famine. And David is looking around to see, how do I explain this? Because a famine is a national disaster. It threatens national security. It threatens the security of the throne. It threatens the authority of the throne. Because what kind of a king are you if you can't keep the relationship with God straight so that God does not punish the land with famine and drought? And so with all of those things, and David gets a response when he inquires from the Lord, uh, he gets a response, you know what, whose fault is this? It's not your fault, David, this is Saul's fault. And also, how do I make this right? God, oh no, God says, it's okay. You can make this right by, by, by killing the remainder of the sons of Saul, seven of them. Now, two of those sons were Rispa's sons, and five of those sons were Mirab's sons. And so he, 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 he hangs them up on crosses, on the hill. Doesn't take the bodies off because it's a sacrificial killing. It's also a political killing. And so leaving the bodies on the crosses means it remains a lesson in terror for those who think they can challenge the king. And it's in the end, my conclusion is not all, it's anything about God. It's not anything about God. It's about David. It's about David. It's a, it's a coldly calculated, real, political understanding of what he is doing. So, and then Rispal, of course, decides, I will not take this. And so she rises up in radical solidarity with the dead children. And not just for her two sons, but for all seven of them, even though five did not belong to her. So what does reconciliation mean for Rispa? And so we talk about that. And so you'll see right through the book, we go back to the Bible all the time, all the time, all the time. One of the reasons why we were so concerned about this is when I began thinking about how things went in South Africa's reconciliation process. You, you know that we had our own reconciliation process. We uh, established a Truth and Reconciliation Commission of which Archbishop Desmond Tutu was the chairperson. And lots of 
amazing things happened and the lots of things that sh could have been equally amazing never happened. And so we are asking why did some amazing things happen and why did we not grasp the opportunity to let everything be amazing about that? Because I am one of those who believe two things about this reconciliation process in South Africa. I believe that we made absolutely the right choice. If there was a choice between saying we are the people who defeated the system of apartheid, we can look back at 300 years and more of slavery and colonization and land theft and destruction and dehumanization and we want revenge for that now that we have the upper hand. That was one, one choice. The other choice was to say, looking back and letting our past totally capture us and keep us in prison and letting the past dictate solely to us as to how we deal with the future would be wrong. Is there a way in which we can look for a future that we can share together and build? And so we made the second choice, but that's the part of reconciliation. I've come to the conclusion that South Africa, and so I believe that that is absolutely the right thing to do. The other thing about our reconciliation process is once we made that decision, we spent half our time looking for ways how to get away with it on the cheap. So can we talk about reconciliation but not talk about remorse? Can we talk about reconciliation but not too much about repentance? Can we talk about reconciliation and forget at all about restitution? Can we talk about reconciliation and bury justice? That, that, that is what, and in the end, our fatal delinking of reconciliation and justice and reconciliation um, and restitution and reconciliation and repentance that fatal delinking made it impossible for our reconciliation to be brought with justice. And so we're sitting with, that's trying to do it on the cheap. I was in the meeting, I was uh, in the leadership of the African National Congress in 1992 when we talked about how we will deal with the past and how we will now come together for the future. So. We had a meeting uh, and we had decided we will establish a truth commission like they had in Chile and in Argentina and in other places in the world, a truth commission. Well, so you deal with the question legally. So you get lawyers, you get judges, you get all of these people and you look at all these uh, criminals against human rights and all of the abuses of human rights and you look at the pain of the people and you make a legal judgment. That's a truth commission. In the middle of this discussion, uh, Mr. Mandela was called out, he went out, he took a telephone call, and the telephone call was from Mr. F.W. de Klerk, who was the last white president of white South Africa, and he, and he came back and he said, well, you know, we're talking about this thing, but Mr. de Klerk has a suggestion. His suggestion is that we do not form a truth commission, but that we form a truth and reconciliation commission. So, shall we talk about that? So they talked about that, and I listened to these people, and I remember these are politicians, right? 90% um, of them have been in exile for 30 years. So they come back home. This is 1992, they haven't been home for more than a year. So we listen to how they talk, and I hear how politicians talk about reconciliation. So I sit there, and I know that because I love the Bible, I know a bit about reconciliation, so I raise my hand. And I say, first of all, I think that this is uh, a wonderful thing to have a reconciliation and a truth commission. Reconciliation for this country is without a doubt the way forward. But secondly, I say to them, you've got to be very careful here. Mr. de Klerk, is an Afrikaner. He thinks his people are the chosen people of God. He thinks 
They have a manifest destiny. But God has put them on earth for a certain purpose and that without them, the world is not right. He believes that he knows the Bible. He also thinks, and perhaps he's right, that he knows our people better than you think he does or better than most of you do. You've been away for 30 years. You don't know. They had, for instance, the ANC had no idea of the role of faith that played such a crucial, crucial part in our struggle for the 30 years that they had been gone. They know that the church has somehow ended up leading the struggle. And they know that we talked about things like justice because we know about Jesus. We said to our people, the moment you say Jesus, you say justice. You cannot pray to God without turning to the struggle and say, that's where God's glory will be seen. You cannot see the pain of the people without thinking of the crucifixion of Jesus and say, we will not let our children be crucified. They don't understand that. Politics, politics have no words for stuff. And so I say to them, Mr. Leclerc thinks he knows us better. And he knows that once you bring in the gospel, it triggers all sorts of other things in the minds and the hearts of our people. When you talk about truth, everybody knows the truth has to come out. The truth has to come out. When you talk about truth and reconciliation, then everybody knows whatever truth comes out, I still face a child of God with whom I have to be reconciled because that's what Jesus was. So the moment you talk about reconciliation, you talk about forgiveness. And we will have to give forgiveness. That's what Mr. Leclerc thinks. But let me tell you, the third thing that you have to watch for this is, once you bring God into this, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> Always. If I were you, I would leave Jesus out of this thing. <laughs> because if our people hear reconciliation, they're going to think about Jesus. And they're going to think about Zacchaeus, and they're going to think about, oh, wow, that means I've got to come, I've got to repent, I've got to confess, I've got to know that I have sinned, I have done wrong, and I haven't done wrong to the sky, I've done wrong to somebody who is a child of God. And so I've got to face that person, I've got to ask that person's forgiveness. I've got to know that forgiveness is not my right. Forgiveness is a gift. If I receive that forgiveness, there is only one appropriate response, and that is justice and restitution. Without that, there will be no wholeness. There will be no restoration. There will be no reconciliation. So I say to them, if you think like Mr. De Klerk, that by adding the word reconciliation, we are going to make this difficult thing a bit less difficult. We're going to be able to avoid all sorts of thorny issues. We're not going to talk about justice because people are only going to think about forgiveness, about forgiveness. You forget the gospel is very clear about things. God will not be mocked. If you use the word reconciliation, I still remember saying, remember, 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 reconciliation is not a bookkeeping term. Somebody made it a bookkeeping term afterwards. But the first time we hear reconciliation is in the gospel. And so it's not balancing the books. It's not sitting down, working out the risks. It's not sort of looking at the pros and the cons, doing analysis of this and analysis of that. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? That's political negotiation. Reconciliation is something different. So they looked at me as if they never understood what I was saying, and maybe they didn't. But I told them, I'm just standing here to warn you, this thing is going to come back and bite us. So, that's what happened. But of course, because we are politicians, and I've been on the political stage, as most of you know, so I know how to do the political thing as well, and so first thing politicians do when they speak to a bunch of Christians, they try to see, how can I grab those words that Christians love so much and use them for myself? 
And so they talk about love and they talk about war as if it is love and they talk about reconciliation, they talk about hope as if it comes from the Bible. That's what politicians do. Your job though is to listen and to say to politicians, hoko, hoko. the moment you use those words, let me allow, tell you what they actually mean. Because that's my job as judge. Because if you use them to abuse them and to abuse the faith and the trust of God's people, then I raise my hand. And if you don't see my hand, I will stand up. And if you don't see me standing up, I will walk. Sometimes we call that a march. <laughs> and so, in South Africa, that is what happened. Uh, they took Mr. Leclerc's solution as a very handy solution. And now, when the ordinary people are saying, well, we've had reconciliation. And we've given forgiveness. And so where is the restitution? And where is the justice? And where is the restoration? And where is the wholeness? The politicians have no response because we try to get it on the cheap. Now that trying to use the political tool clothed in the gospel, that's what we call political pietism. So you talk, you talk, you talk as if you had just been on your knees before God. While you were not on your knees before God, you were on the telephone to some rich guy who told you this is what I want to hear. And, and, and you use all the words, but you don't mean it. You talk about justice, but you don't mean it. That's political pietism. Christian quietism is when we as Christians know that, we recognize that, and we're too afraid to stand up and say that's wrong. That's Christian quietism. So radical reconciliation is reconciliation beyond political pietism and beyond Christian quietism. Radical reconciliation is the reconciliation that says it begins with the recognition of the wrong. It's a wrong that is done to a child of God. The image of God in that person has been assaulted. And I'm a Calvinist, and I keep on quoting this. Calvin has said, in the suffering of God's children, Whenever hurt or injustice is afflicted, it is as if we are wounding God, he says. So the pain of ordinary people, the, the suffering of vulnerable people, whoever they may be, their wounds are the wounds of God. So that's, that's the recognition, that their wounds are the wounds of God. It's wrong done to a child of God, to somebody. Then there comes repentance. And so I recognize, but I will now repent of that. My repentance means that I have remorse, a deep remorse. And I also have to feel shame at what I have done. I have to recognize I should not have done that. This was, this was a sin, not just against God, but against you as well. That's how David gets away with it in that beautiful, beautiful Psalm 57, or 51, right? 51. 51. Now he sins against God, and then he sins against Bathsheba, and then he sins against Uriah. But when he prays, he says, to you and you alone I have sinned. That's not right. That's not right. He has to recognize. Now maybe he thinks... I am a king. I don't have to ask forgiveness from ordinary common people. I only use them. They must be happy that I let them live. So Bathsheba must be joyful that she lives and that they actually marry the woman afterwards. Uriah, he's in the way. He doesn't want to do what I say. He doesn't help me with my cover-up. So I am the king. I get rid of him. And then he goes to God and he says, To you, and before you only. It's not true. It's not true. It's to you, before you, and before you, against you, I have.
person. And so you cannot go to God by stepping around the person you have hurt. You cannot go to God by closing your eyes to the wounds that you have inflicted. You cannot cry your own tears to God if you do not recognize the tears of pain in the other that you have caused. And so, as you go to God with your own tears, you begin by wiping the tears off the face of the person you have hurt. That's remorse. She includes shame, but you can't stay with shame too long because then it becomes a paralyzing emotion. It takes you captive as surely as your violence against others and against yourself has taken you captive. So you don't stay there too long and you don't have to because once you realize I have done something wrong, you don't have to sit with your shame as you have no place to go with it. That's why we've got Jesus, right? So you go with your shame to Jesus as you go with your joys to Jesus and as surely as Jesus hears your cry, for your sins he will take away the shame because the shame then gives you he will give you the strength to take the next step which is to say how shall I make restitution we ask forgiveness and you know as I said before forgiveness is not your right forgiveness is not your right you cannot claim it you cannot demand it you can only ask for it you take the power that you had as the perpetrator that made you think I can hurt this person, I can take away from this person the most precious thing that she's got, whatever that may be, and you put that power in the hands of that person to allow her or him to say to you, yes, you are forgiven. And when I am forgiven, that's the next step, that's when restitution takes place. And when that happens, that's when restoration takes place. And it cannot be done unless you do justice. And it's not just the doing of justice we are talking about. There's always two things with justice. It is first the undoing of injustice. And then secondly, it is the doing of justice. That is what it means to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. That's why the prophet says all of that. If you don't hum walk humbly with your God, how can you find the humility to ask for forgiveness from the person that you have hurt? You don't walk humbly with God, you won't see the injustice that you have erected and systematized so that it benefits you through generations. And you take that injustice and you begin to undo it. And in the place thereof, you begin to build new forms of justice. That's walking humbly with God. Walking humbly with God through life means you see the world humbly through God's eyes. You don't pretend to see other than what God sees. And God sees the pain. God sees the suffering. God sees the vulnerability. God sees how people cringe when you come along. When they see you coming, they cringe. And God says, you've got to see that. You've got to see that. You've got to see that. And once you see that, you understand. But walking humbly with God, seeing things through God's eyes, means also that you can see something t totally, totally, entirely different from what it is. Now, it is only justice and violence, but through God's eyes, there is peace, and there is love, and there is mercy, and there is forgiveness, and there is a future. And you can actually walk hand in hand with the other person. Of course you can. If the lion and the calf can walk hand in hand, if a little child can touch a snake and not be bitten, I can walk hand in hand with you. Of course I can. That's what the prophet means. And so seeing, walking humbly with God, seeing through God's eyes, is both seeing what I have done, but also seeing what I can do through God's grace. How this world can be different. How there is another life possible on this earth. That's radical reconciliation. And so that's the way we talk about it. Let me just see where I am so that I don't talk nonsense around the way. <laughs> and so that's the way we talk about this. And so if you hear the word radical reconciliation, please don't think that we are some extremist group from the third world who wants to come <laughs> and to harm to everybody else. 
Although Martin Luther King did say, didn't he, that we should be as extremists as the prophet Amos, as extremists as Isaiah, as extremists as Jesus of Nazareth. That's radical. And that's reconciliation. I can just say to you, without it, we mustn't play with it. That's what I kept on telling our politicians. Just don't play with it. Just don't play with it. The church needs to learn again, and this is my last word now for this session. Some people say the church has no influence anymore. We have no power anymore. Why do they say that? They say that because fewer folk come to church on Sunday morning. Oh, that might not be the church's fault. It might be my fault as a pastor and a preacher. That's why they stay away. It has nothing to do with the Bible. It has nothing to do with God. It may be just me. So people don't come anymore. Politicians, they say, don't listen to the church anymore. The world has shifted, they say. We don't have that power anymore. People are now much more secularized, they say. They don't listen to the church. They listen to pop music. Rappers have more followers than preachers, they say. Well, we're not powerful anymore because we don't own land anymore the way we used to. We don't have these imposing buildings anymore the way we used to. 475 Riverside Drive was a magic formula in my time. I mean, everybody in the world, when you hear 475 Riverside Drive, that's where the U.S. Council of Churches sits. That's the national, that's a powerful place, man. That's a powerhouse they call this. Well, today, 475 has still got a number on the building, but there's hardly any church folk left in it. Columbia University has taken it all. All sorts of secular stuff. The word of God is not heard. Jesus is never mentioned in that building. So does that mean the church has lost its power because 475 is no longer a power? Of course not. We have lost our power because we have lost our Holy Spirit power. That's why. We've lost our power because we speak not out of conviction but out of custom. We've lost our power because we do not believe anymore that God is in fact willing to use us. You remember the old story of how the devil, in the end, everything is over. And the church still survives as well. And the devil comes to God and, and he says, look, okay, let's just get this over with. You won this battle, right? And then uh, he says to God, but you cheated. Um, you said... Uh, you said you uh, not use the church. And then God says, well, who said I use the church? What does that mean? It means that we do not know what to say. The stones will cry out. We may not know what to say because we think we've lost our power. But God can step outside of the church and use whoever God wants. Our prayer should then simply be, Oh God, wherever you are moving, Holy Spirit, let me be there. Sometimes it might be in the church, if we are lucky, sometimes it will be outside of the church. But wherever we go, we take the Holy Spirit with us. The church has a sacred base that we take onto sacred spaces that nobody else can. And that's why when we rise, raise up our hands to talk about reconciliation, we correct them if they want to abuse it. And we simply say, it's just because the Bible says so. And you'll find, much to your surprise, it's all in that book. You can't be more radical than the Bible. Don't let anybody tell you so. You can't be more, more radical than the Bible. I thought that sometime I was really radical until I really went back and read the Bible. I, oh man, I'm so ashamed of myself. I'm just an ordinary, cowardly, Dutch Reformed priest. I have no clue 
what being radical means. But if you love Jesus, you'll be surprised what God can do through you. All right, let's have some discussion. Uh, we will have time for discussion. I just am going to ask this favor of you, however. Uh, this is a room full, I know, of preachers, and you might be tempted to want to say quite a bit more, maybe, than we're wanting to listen to. So get to the point, okay? And that'll allow a lot of us to be able to have that, to, to join in the dialogue, okay? Thank you. That's what's called a sudden Hawaiian hint. <laughs> <laughs> well, well said. I was just curious, listening to why, what, how you were talking about the um, truth and reconciliation piece of it. The book that I read years ago that I loved was No Future Without Forgiveness, and that was the most transformative book I think I read that year by Tutu. Why is it that it's out of print? Is that having to do with a piece of what you're saying about the reconciliation, or...? Well, um, let me put your mind at ease. It cannot be out of print. I use it with my students this last semester. And it's, 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 it's available. And, and the students had to read every page of it. <laughs> Otherwise, no, this is true. I mean, I tell the, the Archbishop and I are in constant touch with each other. And so if I cannot say to you, the students read your book, they loved your book, and they read every page of it, I can't write about it to him. So it is available. It is a very transformative book. It is a marvelous book. Um, people um, love that book sometimes for the wrong reasons. They love the book because Desmond Tutu talks so much about forgiveness, and that's all some people want to hear. But they forget that towards the very large pages of that book, the very last pages of that book, Desmond Tutu is a long paragraph in which he says, if we do not do justice, if we do not replace the hovels and the shacks with decent homes of our people, if we do not provide them a decent living, if we do not give them decent jobs, if their children can't get decent education, if they do not feel at home in the country of their birth, if we do not do justice, we can kiss reconciliation goodbye. That's what he said in that book. That's a typical Tutu expression. And um, so they, they, they love the book, but they ignore that last part. My job is to begin with the last part. Some people got very angry at me. One of the last times that I spoke in South Africa, um, before I came here, uh, I said, that if, I, if I hear white people in South Africa correctly, I think they love Mandela much more than they love Jesus. Oh, I mean, you should have seen. I had to explain myself on the radio, the television call, the newspapers. It was a big thing. I mean, I was so surprised. And I said, why are you surprised? Of course you love him more than Jesus. Because every time you ask Mandela about forgiveness, he starts off with, oh, we've got to think of building one nation. We've got to love one another. We forgive you. When Jesus talks about reconciliation, he begins first by saying to you, have you read about Zacchaeus? And so you find Jesus much more uncomfortable. You don't want to deal with that question. And so instead of talking to Jesus about reconciliation, you prefer to talk about Mandela. So on this, and then I said to them, that's why you're also afraid that when he dies, because you have more faith and more hope and more trust in Nelson Mandela than you have in Jesus. So, they still didn't like my explanation, but I mean... <laughs> yes, sir. Could you, uh... Since you've been here in the States for a while and will continue to be, could you offer some reflections on what you see going on in uh, this country today vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, growing inequality? Well, um, worldwide, um, South Africa has now become the most unequal society in the world. We have surpassed Brazil, I think, about a year ago, and we now have the dubious honor of being the most divided, or, or the most unequal society in the world. The gap between the rich and the poor is now wider than ever before. 
One of the reasons why that happened was because we followed the example of the United States. We embraced liberal capitalism as if it was the word of salvation. Despite warnings, despite some of us saying, our choice is not between new liberal capitalism and communism. Our, there's a third way for us to ask what is it that this country and her people need. Um, and they didn't want to ask that question. And so because they were promised that if they leave the capitalist system built by white South Africa in conjunction with the rest of the world, if they leave that system intact, if they don't touch the wealth of white people, there will be a small opening and some of us would be allowed to go in there and get as rich as the white people. And that actually happened. That's the one promise they did keep. All of the other promises they did not keep, but that's the one promise they did keep. And so what that means though, is the wider the gap. So we have a small black elite who now share in the wealth of South Africa in, uh, in terrible ways. They show exactly the same disdain for the poor, same carelessness for the poor as all rich people all over the world usually do. Um, and there's the same ongoing exploitation that we've always had. And so what we have is the unrest that you see now in our country has nothing to do with whether Mr. Mandela is dying or not. It's because of this thing. There's labor unrest. There are strikes just about every second week. There is what we call service delivery uh, protest because government uh, people are so bent on enriching themselves as quickly as possible that they are corrupt and they don't care for the services for the people and so the townships people are on the street just about every week and of those demonstrations increasingly almost at this point 80 percent of them turn violent because the anger is so deep we have offered uh, uh, white people forgiveness and we had thought that the only Reciprocal action for forgiveness is justice. That never came. Um, so the young people are angry. It threatens our social uh, a cohesion. And so the old sins of apartheid that we never really got rid of. We never really dealt with racism. Um, and so now it's back. My wife used to say, racism uh, and some of the other sins that we had, um, it's like we buried them in graves that were too shallow. So at the first sign, they all rise up, all these ghosts. And it's easy for them to come out of those graves. And they haunt us every single day. Um, and so what about this? I, I see the same here. Whereas South Africa is the most unequal country globally taken, in the industrial world, the United States is the most unequal society. Um, the 99%, 1% is not even a metaphor anymore. It's really true. Um, the way people in power scrape and bow to let the super rich keep all they can get, and it is the poor who are paying the taxes. The way in which I listen to politicians, and the word poor is never mentioned. Have you noticed that? I, I couldn't understand that. Why are they talking? And they don't, are there no poor people? But of course there are poor people there. The famous 47%, of course they are there. But why are they never mentioned? Except to be told, you've got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, as if there's no systemic injustice in this place. So, so I see the same thing, and all I know, that in my country they try to deflect our attention from these things, by still talking about apartheid. It's not always the old sense. Here they deflect your attention by keeping you busy with wars all the time, all over the world. You have nothing else to talk about because the war, they say, is there because of your fear. Who? Why? So there's lots, I think, for the church to talk about. There's lots of things.
things for us to think about. There's lots of room for a new kind of prophetic witness of the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, not just here, but across the world. Um, societies, uh, let me just put it the other way around. That kind of gap, those kind of, 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 of strains on the social fabric, this kind of tension that builds up, that's not sustainable. I'm not talking about morally wrong, that is morally wrong, but I'm talking as a politician. As a politician, I would be worried because it's not sustainable politically. Something's got to give, is a wonderful American expression. And something is going to give. Well, what happens when something gives? The idea I have in my mind is all of a sudden a gap opens in front of your eyes. Something gives somewhere. You know, you, you live on this island. You know about these gaps that gives and then something spews out of the earth. If you walk and you don't look, you may fall into something that burns. Well, you've got to be on the right side of that gap. You've got to see where you're going. The church can see where we're going. Political analysts pay, get paid to make politicians see what they want to believe so that they can tell the people what we ought to believe. The church, the church does not get paid. The church has an instruction from God to tell the people where they are going so that they know where they're going. And to point out the gaps and the things that will give under our feet. Yes, sir. Doctor, uh, and thank you all for having me here. I'm one of the ecumenical guests, Walter Brownridge, Dean at the Cathedral of St. Andrew. Um, last month, uh, Father Michael Lapsley was here in Hawaii. He was at the Cathedral and at the Church of the Crossroads. And uh, he, and last year when he was with us, talks about, in this context of reconciliation, similar to you, about the avoidance of cheap grace and cheap reconciliation. And he gives this example of, uh, he calls it bicycle theology. You've probably heard it. And it's about the fact that if one steals your bicycle and then comes to you later confessing to that and asking for forgiveness, as you said, you can't presume it. Um, Father Lapsley shares the idea, but I still don't have my bicycle. And I think your answer to the question about inequality gets to this deeper issue of, I'll use the word, um, restoration, um, reclamation, reparations for those who have been denied the resources and the opportunities to share in the vast riches that not only our nation or even in South Africa, but the world has. So would you care to comment on that? Well, the thing about injustices um, is that they are they are generational, and then they are systemic, and so generations profit from the injustices of the systems that have been put in place. And this generation profits from it because the first generation created it. And because it's systemic, it becomes so much part of our lives and is much more difficult to change. So if you talk about reconciliation and you do not talk about the undoing of systemic injustices and the doing of systemic justice, replace the old systems of injustice with new systems of justice. That's why we have government. That's why we have all these institutions in place to make sure that it happened. If that doesn't happen, you don't have reconciliation. And you can't get to the restoration and you can't get to the wholeness. The generational thing is equally important because people today, the young people in my country, keep on saying, Oh, what are you talking about? It's got nothing to do with me. I never voted for apartheid. My parents did, and my grandparents did. And I say, yeah, that's true. And I will not hold you responsible for what they did. I will hold you, however, responsible for what you do today in the 
first thing that you must do, if you say, I never voted for a party, in other words, I'm not responsible for the original theft of your lands, to begin with, something like that is a huge issue in my country today. You've got to ask the question, but do you still benefit from that same system? Because the generations benefit. And so I, I come from uh, slavery, my foreparents. And those who were not in slavery were always cursed because of the color of their skin. Part of my ancestry is of the Khoi, Khoi people, who were the first nation of South Africa. Who, those were the first people who encountered the colonialists as they came. They were the people who were submitted to genocide. Their lands were first stolen before anybody else, and so forth. Um, and their cultures were destroyed. Of their language, almost nothing is left, and all of those things. But generations of whites have now benefited from that. One day I was at the University of Stellenbosch and I was talking about these issues. And there was a young man who came to me and who said to me, well, you know, um, I still do not agree with you on this generation thing. Says, I, you, are, you are laying a burden on me that I, uh, that I cannot take and I don't want it. Says, I have been born uh, now, 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 in the last 20 years, and so we call them, these people, we call them uh, uh, Mandela's white children, because they are born into the freedom of the new constitution. So he said, well, okay. So you did nothing. No, you did nothing. I said, who pays for your university education? Well, my dad. I said, well, let me tell you, that I know about a million kids who would like to go to university like you, without, without a loan that will burden them later on, but with their dad's pay. But you know what? They can't. Sometimes they have no dad. Why? Because your father's policeman killed them. Well, and then he begins to look at me, of course. Because, but, but then it becomes a difficult conversation. And that's what we need. We need a difficult conversation. It doesn't have to be a hateful conversation, it has to be, but, but, but you have to have a difficult, honest, authentic conversation about these issues. So, I tell him about the story that at a university in South Africa, the, the, the president of the university has made a decision. You know what, what the custom at universities is? The professors who teach that their children don't pay tuition. So he says, but that's not very fair, so all of the workers, the women who clean the toilets and the people who work in the garden let their children also come and not pay tuition. So they, they, they can come without paying tuition. So one child uh, told this to her mother and the, the principal was sort of talking to this group of workers and the mother said, thank you very, very much, Mr. President. It's a wonderful gesture. It's an amazing gift. My child can't do it, though. He says, why not? I mean, I pay your tuition. And then she says, well, we used to live close to the city. And then when the Bantustan policy came and the Group Areas Act came, the government took us away and threw us away 50 kilometers outside of the city right now. Do you know how much? There is no public transportation. So do you know how much it costs? for my child to come here. You don't pay the residency fees, which is higher than the tuition fees in my country. And so my child can't come. She cannot make use of this offer because of where I live, because of the salary that I earn, because of the cost of the taxi. Not that she doesn't want to learn, she just can't. So when you have a system that has created opportunities for generations, and you now say, Oh no, I create the same opportunities for this generation of black children. Don't create an opportunity that they cannot make use of because of the generational injustices. You see where I'm going? And one more thing, this boy, 
that I was talking to at Stellenbosch. I asked him, where do you live? He mentioned the place. The place where he lived is exactly the place where my grandfather had his piece of land years ago, where my mom grew up. Then the government came and they were forcibly removed from that place. It was called Ebenezer, along the Elephants River. Beautiful little place. He was a farmer. And um, they were all removed. They were thrown uh, deeper inland. There was no proper land. Small pieces of land, but mostly arid. My grandfather had to stop being a farmer. He had to become a fisherman. So we had to leave Ebenezer and go all the way to Durham Bay to go out there on the boats and to fish. And his other son had to go the same way on the small pieces of land, a few acres that were left. His other two sons did some subsistence farming. Well, my mom always said that my grandfather died of a broken heart. And as a kid, I could never understand what that meant. I meant a broken heart meant a heart attack, right? I said, no, 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 he died of a broken heart. Finally, my older brother, explained it to me. He said, you know, our grandfather was a farmer. His whole life and soul was in the land. That was all he wanted. That was all he lived for. When they took his land away, he did not know what to do with himself. He was ripped from the land. He was alienated from the one thing, the soil, that meant so much to him. They, they, they named the new place New Ebenezer, but of course New Ebenezer is never Old Ebenezer. Old Ebenezer had meant that they were nomads and they had come from a long way, and when they saw this beautiful piece of land next to the river, they settled there, and they had a prayer service, and they said what they said in the Bible, to this place God has led us. You can't say that of New Ebenezer because God did not lead us there. The government threw us there. And so he shriveled away because the soul that thirsted for the land and for the connectedness was not fed and was not nourished and he died. So I asked this young boy, where is your father's land? He says, next to the river. I said, you know what? That land used to belong to my grandfather. Now you give me that back. Then we can talk about how you are no longer responsible. As long as you stay on my grandfather's land, I want you to know that it was not yours. But you see how that goes? But that's the difficult part. Most of us run away from those conversations. But we've got to ask ourselves, do we really talk about reconciliation? if we do not face these difficult questions. So I'm not a big one on reparation. I know it's a huge debate in the United States, and I understand why, but I have one reason why. Reparation, certainly in our context, perhaps in this context too, means that the government finally says, okay, we will pay you a sum of money to make up for what you have lost. Well, number one, you can't ever do that with one sum of money. I mean, who can give me back my grandfather with what money? Or the children who have been killed and murdered and tortured and so forth. Who can take that back? Who can give the sanity back of a mom who lost her mind because of what happened to her kids? You can't. So I say, I don't want reparation. I want systemic justice. Maybe not in my lifetime. But when my children grow up, there will be systems in, of justice in place, guaranteed. And they will reap the fruit because we learned in the struggle. That's one of the things you learn in the struggle. You go out there every day, you face the dogs and the guns and the tear gas. You know you will die, or you might die, or you'll go to prison, or you might be tortured. And you think, I might not live to see this. Kids who've given up their education one day when they want to return to school, it's not possible. But why did they do that? Why did they give up their dreams? Why did they give up their ideals? Why did they give up their hopes for themselves, jobs or careers? They gave it all up. They gave it all up. They laid on the altar because they said, it may not be for me, but for those who come after me, they will see why we have done this. So I want that. 
I want that for my children. I want to see systems of justice in place. Keep your sum of money. It's okay. It's okay. Just make sure that they can live with dignity and then they will make the money that they should. Yes, sir. I keep trying to, I'm a foreigner here for nine years, having come from Japan where I was a foreigner for 12 <laughs> years. I keep trying to think about and apply what you're saying a little more locally than just international or even national because you're looking at a room full of a lot of beautiful flowers but the roots of our churches, our, our relationships, our covenant with one another, I want to believe is healthy, but certainly is challenging. So, do, yeah, <laughs> do the islands need to be restored to a Hawaiian monarchy? I'm thinking about reconciliation. I'm thinking about our Hawaiian and non-Hawaiian Christian churches, brothers and sisters, how we live together as Christ Church in this place, what we can do to continue to work toward um, a genuine restoration, I think, of our common humanity. Um, let me try. There's no quick answer to that, of course, but let me try and just say a few things. I... I will not presume um, to even try to describe to Hawaiians what would be for them the ultimate sign of reconciliation, the restoration of the monarchy or anything like that. So only the Hawaiians will know whether that will help. Only the Hawaiians will know whether a monarchy today will ensure them the justice and the dignity. I have learned to be not cynical, but a lot less romantic about many of the things in our own past. There are many in our people who want to return to traditional things, and I worry about that, because in traditional African society, we had Ubuntu, but women had no rights. We had Ubuntu, but children had no rights. We had Ubuntu, but there was no, there's talk of communality, but there's no talk of right or wrong. Um, and so, and so I say, you must decide what that should be. What I do know is in terms of the churches, we are called to hold up both in word and in deed and set by example what it means to create a reconciled community. And what I have seen here, purely in the documents, and I said this uh, the other day in Kona, you have more than we have had in South Africa. The churches who have connived with those who came here by force and who illegally dethroned the queen and usurped her right over the people and by that act did a lot more because it always has all these consequences for generations. Those churches who were part of that stood up. The UCC did. The UCC did say we had done a great wrong to your forebears and to you. The white Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa, who profited from colonialism and slavery and apartheid, who provided theological and biblical justification for all of that, never said that. The UCC said, we ask your forgiveness. The Dutch Reformed Church never said that. The UCC said, we commit ourselves to work towards justice with you. The Dutch Reformed Church never said that. So you don't have everything here. Of course not. But at least you have a foundation that is not built on sand. My appeal to the churches here, and I appeal to you as a South African, the churches in my country 
are very superficial with these things. We are as guilty as the government of seeking a cheap reconciliation. We are more guilty because we know better. To us more is given, from us more is expected. We allow the politicians to abuse the gospel for their own sake and we said nothing. We allow the politicians to abuse the people's trust and their faith in Jesus because it was a handy political tool at the moment and we let it happen. And so we are not done in our own going to the throne of God in contrition and asking for forgiveness. So I haven't heard that kind of language from our churches. Nobody. Oh, of course there's one and two and three. And they think if Archbishop Tutu says it, he, he talks for all of us. No, 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 he doesn't. He doesn't. And I cannot stand out here and claim, I don't have to say anything, I don't have to do anything, because Desmond Tutu said so already. And so why don't you move on? Well, you don't move on. You stand still and you let the people tell you of their anger. You let the people tell you of their anguish. You let the people tell you of their fears and of their hopes and of their joys. But this church has a foundation that we have never had. My plea with you is, don't mess it up. Build on that foundation. You can be a lot more bold than I think you are, or I think you know you can be. Please, don't let this moment. When the people turn, to talk about forgiveness and to talk about reconciliation and to talk about uh, building a future together, do, do they have any reason to turn to the politicians here? No, because the politicians have never said a word. And as I said before, politics have no words for this, but they can turn to the churches. And perhaps they do. And we are the ones to say, what is it that we can do for justice? And if justice means justice in the church, we will do it. If justice means justice in terms of what politics must do, then we challenge the politicians in the name of God to do that. That's our job. We don't tell the people, don't say this too loud. Our job is to what is whispered in closets of pain and suffering to shout that from the rooftops. That's our job. And that's how we build on the foundation. But you've got that foundation. God has given you a gift that not many of us have. I'm envious of that. And so I ask you. My problem with South Africa is that I think that God has given us such grace and mercy by not allowing us to sink into that quagmire of a civil war. We've been spared the bloodshed. We've been given a chance to do justice. If we don't do that, we'll be spitting in the face of God. Don't, don't, don't let that happen here. You've got such a word to say. You've got such an example to set. You've got such a power to change things. Built on that foundation. I'm sorry I sound preachy to you guys, but I gave a bit. <laughs> Thank you. He could go on and he will, but we should give him a break.